Hi everybody, Captain Bill Safe the Third. A great brown trout video coming your way with lots of action on big fish. In the past, we've discussed tips and techniques to help make you a better fisherman. But the question is always begged, why do we go to certain locations to catch fish? What's the behind the scenes intel that drives us a certain way in the fishery? That's the psychology of fishing that separates the men from the boys. When you gotta put big browns in the basket, why do you make the decisions that you make to have a successful day? It's all about the psychology of fishing and it's what we're gonna delve into in this year's series. Now listen, here's how it is folks. When you turn the video camera on, there's a lot on the line. My pal Dave wants to run for the wheel of heavy work. <laughs> heavy work in the boat. <laughs> yeah, true. And I'm I'm videotaping him because I got all the confidence in the world in him. <laughs> what, what do you think about that, Pop? You got the goods? Yes. You got the goods. <laughs> Alright, so we don't horse this fish, Chris. Now real down tight. There you go, now look back and go down. A little bit to the right there, Jimmy, just a bit. You see that. You see the um, the black handle? If I tell you to pull that to the middle, that's neutral, okay? Straighten back to your left now, straighten back to the left. That's good. Chris is doing a marvelous job on this. Uh, giant. On this fish, just a giant, giant brown. Give me black to the middle, give me neutral. Good, right there, perfect. Crank down. He's gonna get some line right here, nice and easy on him. Make sure that your line doesn't touch any part of the rigger. Keep yep. winding. Forward, Jim, black forward. Push it forward. She in? Yeah, be, be forthright about it. Wheel to the left a little. There you go, good. Look at this tank of a brown. Just come all the way over here to your left, to your left. Rod tip to the left, lad, wind down. Big giant fish. Wind Neutral, Jim. Black to the middle. One more time. Wind back, down up, back. back up. Back up. Back up. Got him, Dave. Oh, yeah. Yes. Look at this guy. Forward, Jimmy. Oh man, what a Ooh, smasher, yeah. smasher, <laughs> smasher, <laughs> brown. This guy <laughs> is an absolute <laughs> tanker of a brown. He is a beauty, and he's got all those fall colors. Purple clown, absolutely punishing him today, isn't it, Dave? Yeah. Color clear water. Hot spoon, hot spoon. We're coming in and out. Let's take a look at this. Get right over here with him, Dave. Chris, get right with Dave over there. Let's take a look at that. Uh, let's take a look at that spoon, Dave. Not much you, can less see, you can see how those browns have been chewing that purple clown up today. This, look at this, look at this fish. He is just an absolute smasher. Chris, hop over here, right behind, right but no, take the rod right with you. Dave's gonna pose it. Get it right up. Look at this fish. What a dandy, dandy brown. He's good. Lift his tail a little, Dave. Look at that guy. Long, long fish. That brown's probably going to go... 11, 12? I would say, and he's going to be 31 or 32 inches long. Very rare to get a big brown like that that breaks, uh, you know, 30 inches. But this guy, just a superior, superior fit. As big brown trout pour over the transom of the Safe Charter 5, let's go to Brown Trout Lodge and examine the real life factors that go into making quality spring fishing decisions. Action on brown trout on Lake Ontario today. As we promised, um, we're going to visit the psychology of why we go to certain places and how we pick an area to run in the morning. And, and many times you got to understand this. We may never have been on that stretch of shoreline before, but if you can read a map, if you can read a weather report, and you know where estuaries are, you know where tributaries flow into the lake, at least you can make educated decisions about where you should fish for brown trout. Now, it doesn't matter what map we have. Here, I happen to have a map of uh, the area south of Henderson, but there's a couple things that you wanna take a look at. You wanna take a look at the points, you want to take a look at the estuaries, you want to take a look at rock outcroppings, and you want to take a look at where rivers and streams flow into Lake Ontario. Now, if we back up 25, 30 years, we always went to sand. First thing in April when we were trying to catch a brown trout, we wanted to go to wherever the expanse of sand flat was, wherever we could get the warmest water, and there was always uh, 
plenty of brown trout in those areas. Well, what's different about 25, 30 years ago and today? Well, back then the rainbow smelt was a crazy population in Lake Ontario, and they're gonna find that warmest water and they're gonna be in there and they're gonna be feeding. People who don't live this fishery like we live the fishery, think that alewives are gonna assault that shoreline early in the season. They're not. Alewives come in to spawn like the first week of May, sometimes not till the second week of May. So what attracts brown trout with rainbow smelt gone along the shoreline, what attracts brown trout and holds them in those areas? Well, plenty of times it's a non-native invasive species. It's the round goby minnow. Uh, it's been good for our perch population. It's been good for our walleye population. And, and more importantly, it's been good for our brown trout population. Well, where are gobies early in the spring of the year? In the winter, they're out in two or 300 feet, but then they migrate back in. Are you gonna find them on sand expanses where the water gets the warmest first? Probably not. You'll find a few, but more importantly, you're gonna find them on broken rock or what we refer to as cobble rock or pea gravel bottoms. So if you take a look, if we come back to the map, it's easy in early April to identify rock structure here on Stony Point Light. Right between Boomer's Bay and Ray's Bay, there's rock structure right here. There's rock structure on Clark's Point. There's rock structure on schoolhouse on the schoolhouse run coming into Stony Creek. There's rock structure just outside this estuary in Black Pond. There's rock structure here on Drown Island. You could run the sand all the way up here, but so many times fishermen will be working this area in five to six feet of water on sand. And we'll have boats in the safe charter fleet working the perimeter of Drown Island, catching two, three browns at a time, while people in here directly on the sand are rarely getting a bite. So those are the kinds of things that you wanna take a look at. You also wanna think about things like, what was the temperature the night before? If you're working the South Shore, like we are in today's video, we've got <clears throat> apple orchards that are heating up during the course of the day that water's flowing after rains across that that heated land it's coming into estuary type scenarios and it's flowing out streams into lake ontario the potential for that river water to be two to four degrees warmer than the other surrounding water is a very real possibility the other thing that you want to look for is where is water going to pocket let's take a look at the map again if we've got a, a south wind that's coming down this shoreline and it's picking up all this beach water that's warm and it's pulling it down where is it going to pocket and deposit it it's going to pocket it here in this pocket bay it's going to pocket in this pocket bay is it going to be here no because any warm water that's in this in a south wind is going to get driven offshore in this manner so you want to look at where the wind's blowing in, where it's pocketing that warm water. And the other thing that's a benefit to that is not only is the warm water going to be there, but when a little bit of breeze pushes in there, it stirs up the sediment. So now it's easier for those brown trout to hunt under cover. They get activated because they like those conditions. You've got warm water. You're concentrating on uh, broken rock bottom where you've got some actual forage base in there to feed on. And more importantly, the conditions are right for those brown trout to hunt. So you can expect more activity in those areas. Those are the things that you wanna think about before you even fire the boat up in the morning. Here's the last critical point that I'm gonna leave you with. Just because you caught fish in a certain spot today does not mean that you're gonna catch those fish in that spot tomorrow. So many people go to that well and they wanna dip another bucket of water out there just as long as they possibly can and keep reaping the benefits of that spot. More than likely with the changing tapestry of the fishery on a daily basis in Lake Ontario, it's rarely gonna happen the same two days in a row. So I want you to just scratch what happened today out of your mind, use and take the important pertinent information from the day, but examine the conditions for the following day on their own merits. 
and make a quality educated decision about where you should be to put fish in the boat. Don't get trapped into going back to the same spot time and Absolutely time again. waffled the big browns here today. Dave, can you clear that cooler so I can get a look at those fish in there? Absolutely waffled the big browns here and we just took a punishing strike on the port planer board. What's the inside rod there, Dave? Caddyshack? Yeah. Yeah. Inside. No, no, nope, nope, it was the inside rod. Remember what yeah. it was? No. Oh. oh, purple. Yeah, purple clown. And flying out of the water. I wish we could have got the camera on it fast enough to see. Big giant steelhead is what it looks like. He was out of the water as much as he was in it. Keep your rod tip right out here to the right. Look at the browns. Just slaughtering the big browns here today on the south shore of Lake Ontario, punishing them. And uh, Captain Dave Singari's at the wheel with me. He's going to come back. And uh, Jimmy, you want to slip in and take the wheel there for me? And Dave, you come back and net this fish. We've got uh, Chris Cameron on the rod here again. This guy was going crazy, huh, Chris? Oh, yeah. Jumping out of the water. We've had uh, three big browns on today that were all over 10. One we dropped right at the transom and as part of a double. Got one that's at least 31, 32 inches long, which is really, really good for, for a brown trout. And then this fish just absolutely slammed it. Jim, we'll play in and out of neutral like we did before when I tell you. Let's come on right in here and uh, Captain Dave's going to net this fish. He was flying out of the water, wasn't he? He was out of the water more than he was in it. This nice is a, fish. This is, is going to be a good looking fish right here. Just stay, we're going to stay with the action right here. We've got a weight rod running right here. I'm watching this rod just in case that fish makes a move and gets in it. We can pick this rod, go up over the top, or go underneath the fish. Jimmy, give me neutral, black to the middle. Big fish right here, Dave. See him? Might be a brown. Wind down. Big brown. Big brown. Wind down, wind down, wind down. Okay, back come up, on, back, back up. up. Got him. Big chunk oh, forward, Jimmy. Look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful brown. He was flying. I was 100% sure that was a steelhead, and he is just a jammer. Look at this brown. Just a dandy. Not much the, left. Look at the condition of that purple clown. <laughs> awesome, awesome lure in the spring of the year. Good job, buddy boy. Thank you. Thank well you. done. Thank you.